Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org. In partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Jim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is going to be a, a very powerful show. I have very strong opinions, and I'm going to start out with just a little bit of a rant to set up the conversation that we are going to be having throughout the next hour. You know, the hypocrisy when it comes to handling healthcare disparities, I think is just astounding. We see it across the media daily from federal lawmakers speaking out about helping the most vulnerable communities across the United States. And yet when it comes to putting their money where their mouth is, they fall short. Each year, the powers that be update the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, or PFS, looking at how much each physician is reimbursed for their services. And they determine whether to allocate more money to certain areas, less to others. Due to a required budget neutrality by law, for one to receive an increase in allocation, other areas must see a decrease in reimbursement for services. Robbing Peter to pay Paul has worked in the past with cuts evenly spread across all practices, but really not now, and not at the expense of patients, their limbs, and eventually their lives. Some of the hardest hit with this year's reimbursement cuts are those who are considered limb savers. These vascular surgeons, interventional cardiologists, and interventional radiologists are the so-called plumbers of the human body, and it's their amputation prevention services that are taking the hit, particularly in community-based clinics known as office-based labs or OBLs. Now these OBLs are independent outpatient facilities that treat patients with chronic ailments such as end-stage renal disease, venous disease, as well as diagnose and treat one of the most debilitating diseases most have never even heard of, yet impacts one in five over age 60. The disease known as peripheral artery disease, PAD, which is a circulation issue that impacts mainly the leg arteries and can lead to amputation. High amputation rates in minority communities are attributed to geographic and socioeconomic disparities. OBLs infiltrate these communities to reach the most at-risk patients where they are, breaking down many of those barriers to timely diagnosis and timely effective treatment. This helps patients live a better quality of life and become less of a financial burden on our healthcare system. But this care is in jeopardy, and that's what we're going to be discussing on this show, along with vascular surgeons, Dr. Paul Gagne and Daniel Nathanson, both with the Cardiovascular Coalition, helping to fight for the rights of these doctors in OBLs. So with that said, whoo, off my soapbox. <laughs> John, what do you think? Is it time for a moment of, of inspiration I, before we go well, into this heated discussion? But, no, I, well, I, I just have to say, and this actually dovetails into uh, my moment of inspiration, um, but you really pulled the, the pin out of that grenade. Uh, so th this should be an interesting conversation because, um, you know, I, I don't know, and at least where I practice, we, and it's a hospital-based system and we don't have an OBL, uh, you know, we try to provide, and I think do a pretty good job of providing care to everyone in our community. Yes, there are disparities w within distribution of care, uh, I'd be interested. I, we'll have to explore what you said further. I, I'm, I'd be curious to know how the the OBLs are are helping that. So this will be this will be a good conversation. But man, <laughs> this will you know I next time we do we, we, we need to get some you know a legislator or someone who um, is involved in in some of these uh, decision makings on the hill uh, with respect to reimbursement. So at any rate, looking forward to this one. This this will be a good one. 
you know, we, we don't shy away from from controversy, do we? We we address those tough topics head on. <laughs> well, right. Never let a good crisis go to waste, right? <clears throat> no. So before we get into this whole debate, let's have a moment of inspiration. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular, vascular moment of inspiration. Well, so again, the dovetail of pulling the grenade as to what I said, uh, June 6, 1944, D-Day. So we just celebrated that a couple days ago. I think that's what, 79 years. I was looking for a quote um, just to kind of uh, speak to to the nature of the individuals who uh, at least were from the Allied troops who, who kind of landed on Normandy. And I think we lost about 4,500 soldiers or so. And obviously you can get uh, quotes from Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Churchill and things in that nature. But I, I found this one from private first class Joe Lezwinski, uh, who, you know, a, again, just a literally a soldier on the, on, on the beach. And he said, quote, I don't feel that I'm any kind of hero. To me, the work had to be done. I was asked to do it. So I did it. When I lecture kids, that is what I tell them. And... Wow. You know, again, let's talk about the PAD work that we do here. There's work that needs to be done. It's gonna, it's getting done at other places, whether it's in a hospital or an office-based lab or an ambulatory surgical center. And I'm really excited to hear from our physicians uh, who are on the on the show with us to kind of get their opinion and understanding of 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 the process. So, with without any further ado, let's let's jump into this. I do think that, you know, anyone that is involved in in treating peripheral artery disease is truly a hero. There are so many people on the front lines, whether it's someone in the front office answering the phones, whether it's, you know, a nurse practitioner or even a chief of marketing officer. I last night had a patient that was told by a, one hospital after a CT angiogram, never had any sort of endovascular procedure with wires and balloons or anything before. He wants to do, this is frontline treatment at this hospital in the middle of Ohio. I almost sent her to you, still May, aorto, aorto bypass, just on one leg, femoral bypass, wants to do a fem fem and a fem pop all in one big procedure. So well, I call up this marketing person and I say, oh my gosh, you have an office based lab that's right nearby there. They're opening up next week help me. And she gets on the phone with the doctor. The doctor calls me at 630 at night last night. and was like, I just looked at the CT angiogram. Uh, we can do this with wires and balloons. This is no problem. Again, um, and, and more than one way to quote skin the cat surgery is always, a, a, so, you know, I sent two patients to surgery this week after I did the angiogram, but to our point, we always stress this to the patients that are listening, get a second opinion, get a third opinion. Yeah. Make sure you're comfortable with the game plan. Uh, you know, physicians aren't necessarily, in my opinion, out there to just cut on people for the sake of you know doing a doing yeah. an operation. But you're right. I we'll have to talk offline because I want to see where you sent this patient to in my neck of the woods. Yeah, you never know. They could be coming your way. You know, I don't care where the doctor is, what facility they're in. I'm just looking for the best, most effective, timely care for the patient. That is right for them, which also depends on insurance, depends on their comorbidities, comorbidities, a lot to consider. But it was really one of those situations where it proves it is important for patients to have options. And that's what of we're course. going to start discussing with Dr. Daniel Nathanson and Dr. Paul Cagney coming up right after the break. So stay mm -hmm. with us. Welcome back to the show. Today, we are talking about Medicare cuts for physicians and the impact it might have on options for patients with one of the most debilitating diseases most have never heard of, yet impacts one in five over age 60, one in three diabetics over age 50, and three in five people who suffer a heart attack have plaque buildup in their legs known as peripheral artery disease or PAD. We have with us vascular surgeons, Dr. Paul Gagne and Dr. Daniel Nathanson. Uh, they're with the Cardiovascular Coalition. They're trying to educate legislators on these cuts and why they should roll them back. Um, but we want to find out because first off with, with Paul and, and Daniel, you both were, it's not affecting the hospitals, it's affecting these independent office-based labs. And you used to be working full-time in the hospitals. 
but now you have your own independent labs. So I want to talk about what your experience was in the hospital and why you decided to shift to treating in an independent lab and how that has become a catalyst for fighting for more options for patients. Why don't we start with Daniel? Uh, yes, my name is Daniel Nathanson, and I um, have an office-based lab in San Francisco. We've been there since 2015, so it's been almost eight years. And I worked in uh, the largest private hospital in San Francisco for many years. And what I found was that if you had a stroke or heart attack, this was the best place to be. But for 90% of my patients, <laughs> they need outpatient, minimally invasive, procedures to address their underlying chronic issues that includes uh, peripheral arterial disease and dialysis access intervention for patients who have dialysis. And this was from a patient's perspective, much better done in a small outpatient environment where everybody is geared towards the care of that patient. And the response from the communities, uh, the community in San Francisco, our patients have been unanimous uh, and 100% positive. It's been an amazing experience for our patients. We're able to get them in much more quickly, much more effectively, and out the door, and they have their problems treated. Whereas in the hospital, they would often get lost uh, in the shuffle. Uh, there'd be other priorities, very sick patients with acute problems, but now the experience has been much better for our patients. And I think COVID shed light on the value of the office-based lab and the limitations of a hospital in, in treating some of these patients with peripheral artery disease, venous disease, and who need that dialysis access. There wasn't that timely care for them. For them, you know, a lot of the, they were prioritizing the COVID patients, of course. I mean, why wouldn't they? But we had a patient, for example, and just an example of literally hundreds that we helped during COVID to go from the hospital to an office-based lab simply because these hospitals at the time with a pandemic were overrun, you know, by, and, and they were overburdened. So we had one patient in particular, they were, they said, hey, we if we got you in today, we could literally treat you, but we can't get you in. We have no room. We can't even get in the, in the, in the lab. So come back in a few weeks when we slow down and we'll just amputate it. We were able to get them to an office-based lab and actually get them treated right away and saved their limb. And, and that's and, just one of and, many. Yeah. And Daniel, obviously you bring up a, a fantastic point about the value of an office-based lab or OB, OBL or an ambulatory surgical center, ASC, the nim very nimble and you can get patients in quickly. I mean, they're very efficient. Um, but, but Paul, let me ask you this question because you have an office-based lab as well. I, I believe Medicare and the insurance companies save money by sending their patients to these facilities as opposed to the hospital due to just how the technical fees and, and you know the overhead right. at the hospital versus the ASC OBL. Is that, is that true? The problem is that we have this flexibility. Uh, we have complete control of that schedule, those resources. And as uh, Daniel pointed out, you know, in the in the hospital, sometimes we're standing in line behind, behind patients that are sicker. And although the patients that we're taking care of with gangrene or non-healing wounds at risk for amputation uh, may be uh, at risk of losing a leg, they're not imminently at risk of losing a life. So they get lower on the pecking order. And uh, sometimes their condition deteriorates while they're waiting to get that care. Good. So we have that flexibility. But is there not, isn't there a, a Medicare and the insurance companies save some money by sending patients to these facilities as opposed to the hospital, correct? Yeah, the reimbursement uh, to the facilities and hospital, excuse me, to the facilities and doctors in the OBL, maybe a third of what it is to, to the hospital. And so the taxpayer and Medicare are saving money uh, using these facilities and for, for the exact same service the patient would get at the hospital. And you know what's interesting to me is even though it does save them money, they still prioritize emergency care. If a patient goes through emergency for in need of revascularization or restoring of that blood flow in the legs, they're quicker to move forward and approve that in an emergency versus in an office-based lab. Our experience is sometimes it takes one, two weeks to get approval, if at all. 
which just seems like it, it, we had one patient in Georgia who went to the emergency room at 10 o'clock at night, we got the call. They were going to cut off her leg first thing in the morning. And she was courageous enough to say, no, I have another option. We got her to another doctor at an office-based lab over in Atlanta. And he was able to go in with a quick balloon and, and a wire and save her leg. No problem. It took 25 minutes. I mean, I, yes, I would hope, I would hope that that's a outlier, uh, it's not. Um, but, but, um, I wish it was. you know, again, I, I think as we mentioned the efficiency and the ability to get people in the same day, I think it makes it very attractive to the patients as well as the, the referring physicians to look to physicians who can do endovascular work in an, in an OBL versus the hospital. So not only are the patients better served, but it's an excellent point. We are saving taxpayers and Medicare a third of the cost. And so the patients, uh, it's a better experience for the patients. It's more effective. It's more impactful. And on top of that, we are, uh, are saving the system and the taxpayers money. And what we found in San Francisco, especially where our costs are very high, we've had 30 to 40% OBL reimbursement cut. It goes year after year after year, and we're not going to be able to sustain it much longer. And it's going to be a real problem for our community in San Francisco if our center closes down because we are the only one. And I won't be able really to practice in the hospital at this point the way I'm able to. I won't be able to serve my patients. And that's where I'm going to have to go if these cuts continue. Well, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to talk more and get into the heart of these cuts and the impact they're going to have. So stay with us. Before we went to break, we were just beginning to hit the tip of the iceberg, I think, with respect to the cuts that are going to be seen in the office space labs and presumably the ambulatory surgical centers. So, uh, Daniel, I'll start with you. Tell us what exactly, you know, what does this mean for a, a, a small business owner such as yourself, right? Well, yes, that's exactly right. Um, we are act as small business owners. Um, it's our responsibility to balance the the needs of uh, our community uh, with the needs of our office. We um, reimburse all of our employees just like any other um, small business. We have to make sure that their retirements and benefits and everything else. And on top of that, we have to make sure that everybody is focused in a team-oriented fashion on the patient. And because of that, um, it's been a very successful model. Uh, on the other hand, if we continue to have to endure these cuts, the model will no longer function because we're getting a thinner and thinner margin and eventually we'll just start to lose money and we're not that far away uh, from that with all of these cuts. Well, yes. I mean, not only the cuts at the same time, 8% what in, in inflation. So you're barely a break even and that's leading to a lot of consolidation in the office-based setting, right, Paul? And what, what is the impact of that on patients and, and potential um, choice when it comes to that? So when you have consolidation, then the natural next step is let's cut out uh, access in areas that are not doing as well. There's not as many, not as much of a profit or there's not as much that the balance sheet is challenged more. And, and as a result, sites of care get closed down uh, and, and patients have to travel longer distance and have bigger barriers to overcome to get the care they need. So consolidation is also and tends to drive up the, the care of co the cost of care in those areas. So it really defeats the uh, purpose right. of these office-based labs, right? Which are the ones that are infiltrating these most vulnerable communities and trying to democratize care to some of the minorities, African-Americans, Hispanics, Indians, who have the highest risk of amputation. It, it, yes. Right. And and then I, let me just real quick, I think we have like two minutes left and we'll probably, dis I'd like to discuss this at the next segment, but it, it, if if there's pressure to you know be sustainable and the margins keep getting thinner, we all know that, and for the listeners, certain procedures pay more than others, right? And so do you guys fear that um, 
certain procedures might be might be or uh, well i guess are currently being done more so in, in patients that may or may not benefit them from them to generate a higher um, code uh, for reimbursement uh, or would that is that a potential issue moving forward or is that just me talking crazy and actually, I'm going to have you hold that thought because that's a really important question and it needs some time because I am wondering if that's why these office-based labs do have a target on their back, a few bad seeds being responsible for taking advantage of some decisions Medicare made 15 years ago. So stay with us. You don't want to miss this discussion. Before we went to the break, I, I guess I pulled another pin on a grenade with respect to disparaging uh, treatment in OBLs, ASCs versus the hospital based on differences in reimbursement. Um, and just again, for the listeners, there are certain procedures that we do that don't cost a lot of money. There are other procedures that we do that do cost more money and the reimbursement is higher. And, uh, you know, if, again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if I get paid $300 to do something and then I get paid $2,000 to do something similar to that, Sometimes we might be leaning towards doing the $2,000 thing. And then particularly with potential cuts to the reimbursement, the question that I posed to doc, doctors, uh, Daniel and, and Paul was, do you think that people are going to, in the OBLASC space, are going to start doing more of the $2,000 procedure when they can get away with the 300 Yeah, I think the uh, the problem uh, around this that question, uh, John, is, the data around these procedures is not clear. I think that when you start looking at the data, uh, you will follow it. And I think in some instances, it's clear you need to just do the less expensive procedure. Uh, in other circumstances, based on what data is available, a physician's experience, they may migrate to the more expensive procedure. There is a um, issue there of reimbursement, I think that almost all doctors are going to do the appropriate um, procedure for the patients that they have in front of them and will not try to reverse engineer the system to get maximal compensation. But um, unfortunately, the way the system has been set up, uh, there are a, a few, a very small number of people, but there are a few who uh, are uh, looking at that uh, issue, the reimbursement uh, part of the equation a little bit too closely. It's interesting because I think that there are always going to be bad seeds wherever they are. And right now, the target is on your back because 15 years ago, there were some incentives put into place by CMS, you know, for the treatment or advanced treatment of people with peripheral artery disease. And there was some data that came out that showed that only 90 doctors were responsible for a third of all payments made between 2017 and 2021. And on top of that, despite those treatments, amputation rates continue to rise. And, and that doesn't really, you know, bode well. As you said, those few bad seeds can certainly put that target on your back. However, by the same token, there are bad seeds within hospitals as well. Who is looking at the amputation rates and taking a second look? to ensure that those amputations were in fact necessary or were they premature? Could something else have been done with limb salvage to save those folks' legs using advanced tools and techniques? There's, there's no big brother on these amputations either. So I, I'm wondering if that is something that we need to bring to the forefront as well and say, hey, there's bad seeds here, but mm, there's bad seeds here. And we need to create some sort of an equal accountability system. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, you can, you can be a doctor in the hospital that's doing things um, that are unscrupulous uh, and are abusing the system uh, for personal gain uh, or um, are just not um, uh, meticulous enough or thoughtful enough in how they're doing the procedures and that can happen anywhere. The problem is that in the outpatient setting, because they are the one person that's receiving a somewhat larger reimbursement, the magnitude of any kind of unscrupulous behavior is much larger in that population. So they're much more visible. And gotcha. there is a, a, and it's an issue because it's a, a, a um, problem for the future of OBLs. 
Kim, I think one thing that we've uh, started to do uh, over the last few years is we have a coalition of uh, OBLs and we have what is traditionally called an M&M conference every month, which is anybody who's trained in surgery knows what that is, where you look at complications, you look at outcomes, and you analyze the way you're doing things to get best outcomes for patients. And that's absent in a lot of OBLs, but there are a lot of OBLs that have come together, either whether they're tied together in a business fashion or whether they just are tied together out of a desire for best practices to uh, have these kind of conferences where you review with your peers uh, what you're doing and best practices. And I think, you know, that's what's always been used in hospital uh, settings to uh, get best outcomes. And I think being able to promote that and do that in your practice and in, with other practices is perhaps a way to go forward to get uh, these bad apples uh, out, of the, out of the box. Yeah, and Paul, I, I would just applaud you all for doing that because I think, one of the issues it, with OBLs is the lack of oversight and it's kind of, you know, the wild, wild west out there. Um, but, you know, let's, let's be honest. I mean, this, this reimbursement and this fee for service structure was it's Medicare or I'm sorry, CMS. I mean, they designed this and it's still, as we were talking about in the break, it's still cheaper for CMS to send a patient to an OBL for their same procedure uh, as it is, as it is in the hospital. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention too was, the primary care physicians, and we talked about this as well. I mean, they're taking at-risk contracts with insurances, meaning Mr. Smith, you get, you know, they, they pay the, the seat, the primary care physician, let's say what 20, I don't know. I'm making up a number $20,000 to care for that patient the whole year. Well, I mean, if I've got $20,000 and I can send my patient to Paul or Daniel, and it's going to cost $6,000 where I send my patient to the hospital and it's going to cost 15,000, well, that delta is so much different, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do what's cheaper for me because I, as a PCP, as a primary care doctor, they get a cut of that money coming back to them if if they save their insurance company that money. So, I mean, these OBLs, ASCs, I think are they do a great thing. Again, it's just having better oversight uh, and management to some degree. And, and John, what that's about the, I was gonna say that's the you. whole strategy about the capitated care, right? Is to cut costs. I'm sorry, Kim. That's okay. So I'm curious about this new legislation. How is this going to help uh, maintain these OBLs and possibly have some sort of maybe bipartisan support in this? That's the only way you're going to get this through. Um, tell us about this new legislation, what its goals are, and um, how likely it's going to come to fruition and, and pass. So the, the new uh, legislation that's been sponsored by uh, Dr. Bill, um, and Congressman Bilirakis uh, and others uh, in a bipartisan way is designed to offset the labor costs uh, that uh, were um, increased uh, or rather uh, reimbursed at a higher rate for a lot of the primary care doctors. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier in the broadcast, this was uh, uh, has to be budget neutral. And so those of us who are doing procedures in the office uh, got a hit to our reimbursement and decrease by another eight or 9%. So this new legislation that I would encourage all the listeners to support who know anybody who's had PADs, had an amputation, who has to travel you know, long distances for care for their blood vessels. Uh, if they support the legislation is designed to decrease that cut so that as uh, Daniel said, uh, we can stay in business and continue to provide this care. Without this bill, which is gonna essentially uh, salvage our OBL, I mean, you know, there are, are thinner margins in areas of increased overhead and also probably thinner margins with doctors who are uh, more interested in, in making sure that the indications for their procedure are solid and that the uh, particular procedure that they're doing is correct. These margins get thinner and thinner and thinner, and then it gets to the point where we just can't uh, support our practice. And what this bill does is it actually allows us to stay in practice. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to find out what resistance they're facing and hurdles they have to overcome to get this through. So stay with us right here on the show. Gentlemen. What are, I mean, what do you, do you think this bill is going to pass or I, maybe has it passed already or, or is it uh, still being debated? Now, this is a bill that's uh, recently been introduced and is still very much in the process of Congress to try to get to a, a resolution and uh, to pass it. Uh, so it actually requires still a fair amount of lifting 
uh, to move this forward and, and gather further support uh, in the House uh, to that end. As Kim mentioned, of course, it's a bipartisan bill, which is great. Uh, but in the busy Congress, there's a lot to do. And we need to make sure that this bill stays front and center on the agenda. So this is H.R. 3674. And uh, if we can get uh, voices across the country to uh, speak to their congressmen and support it, uh, that's how we're going to get this uh, across the finish line. Daniel, who who's resisting it? Who's button heads with you guys to to push this through? Who's who has the potential to prevent it from happening? And what is their power? You know, it's it's a little bit unclear. Um, I think that there's always a push to cut costs to save money, uh, combined with uh, the few bad actors and um, you know a bad reputation for certain procedures because small numbers of people abuse them. I, that's the only thing that I can think. I mean, it's a little bit of a black box what goes on in, in the halls of Congress and how they come uh, to make these decisions. But essentially, I think that the bottom line is that our voice needs to be much larger. You know, we we are uh, we don't have the numbers um, of the people uh, that are the same as the people that are doing these procedures in the hospital. And, um, you know, we, we don't quite have that same exposure. So it's just a, I think, a, a question of uh, hammering away at our legislators, uh, making sure that this bill stays front and center. Yes, it has been introduced, but it has not been passed. And, and as Paul says, they are, there's a, a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done to get this across the finish line. And uh, that's a, a big job, but I think it's not insurmountable. Paul, do you, do you anticipate potential pushback from hospital systems? I mean, are, are, I get, let me ask you this, are hospital systems, are there, are there payments getting cut? The hospital systems payments have gone up uh, as, as recently as uh, 2022. So I, I would imagine that then it would be in the hospital system's best interest to keep patients there as opposed to Absolutely. Going to the they just have the, 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 the loudest, the biggest lobby. It comes from the hospital and, and ours isn't you know, it's at large as theirs. You know, it's, in, right. it's, it's really interesting about, though, is hospitals, even the nonprofit hospitals have to make enough money to stay open. And for the types of procedures we're doing in the OBLs, we have data that across uh, multiple hospital systems that show that actually they lose money doing these procedures. Yeah. Uh, that they are, you know, hospitals are designed for really sick people uh, who need big operations and big procedures. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about sick people, but need minimally invasive procedures. And so, you know, even though a lot of hospitals uh, come out against this because they don't understand it well, uh, in reality, it's in their best interest. But as uh, Daniel said, it's not clear who's against this. And I'm off, I often wonder if it's just inertia uh, that uh, keeps these things from happening. Yes, here's the, here's the deal. There are enough patients to go around. Supposedly, according to the Sage Group's Mary Yost, she's saying that there are more than 18 million people in the United States alone with peripheral artery disease. And we have yet to even, you know, get even a, a small percentage of that in there and get them treated soonest. So there are plenty of patients to go around for any for anyone and everyone already in hospitals. I have patients waiting months, even half a year, up to a year to get in for a vascular consult. I mean, it takes weeks to get them in for a surgery. Just last night, this one patient that has a wound can't even get in for three weeks to get a consult with her doctor. So it is the reality of what we're seeing right now with peripheral artery disease that we do need choice. We need timely, effective care for these people. So I, I hope for the best in that the government will come in and, and help maintain that choice for all of our patients. Yeah, Kim, I, I would say, you know, if you, were, if you were going to the hospital and had an infection and you were told that you couldn't get an antibiotic for three weeks, uh, you, you wouldn't believe it. And, and that's the problem we have. And some, sometimes the hospitals are so busy that we have patients with gangrene. We can't get into the hospital in a timely fashion. And, and that's our antibiotic. It's surgery or revascularization. And so it's mind boggling. Uh, but unfortunately, as you point out, it's a reality. And by having more sites of care uh, that are doing high quality work uh, that is being you know, peer reviewed among their peers, uh, this is how we're going to drive those costs down. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And this is going to be an ongoing uh, conversation, and we're going to just keep it flowing as we get updates 
on the Kim, progression. Kim, I, I think the, the grenade didn't quite go off, but it's still ticking. But a great show. Appreciate the conversation, everybody. Hi, everyone, and welcome to hour two of our weekly discussion. This hour is known as One Step Away. It's co-hosted by our Pad Warrior Chief, Douglas Salisbury, and another Pad Warrior and legendary Harlem Globetrotter, Larry Shorty Coleman. He is here with us as well. We have quite a few Pad Warriors that have joined us. And just to catch everyone up on today's discussion, we're talking about Medicare cuts that our doctors are trying to fight because they're affecting doctors who are working in what are called office-based labs or outpatient um, labs. They're facilities that are independent of a hospital facility, and it's where they only treat, let's say, venous disease or peripheral artery disease, or they do dialysis access and that kind of thing. So we are going to open up the discussion. We want to talk about what these Medicare cuts are, how they're affecting or may affect you as a patient and your options that are out there. But we want to hear your experiences about getting treated in a hospital versus an office-based lab, whether they're horror stories, success stories, whatever they might be. And we have Dr. Daniel Nathanson. He's out of San Francisco and Dr. Paul Gagne, who is out of Connecticut, both actually are vascular surgeons in outpatient patient facilities who used to work in hospitals. And so I want to start with them. And then as you guys all want to participate in the discussion and share your stories, just go ahead and raise your hand or post in comments and we will get to you and have you go ahead and share. But this is a chance for your voice to be heard. Recognize that some of these um, stories will be shared publicly. So if you don't want it shared publicly, just go ahead and stay um, waiting in the wings. But I'm going to open it up to first, you might be repeating yourselves a little bit, but we'll start with Daniel, and then we'll go to Paul and talk about your experiences in treating patients in a hospital and why you chose to go to an independent office-based lab to treat patients with PAD. Yes, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Nathanson. I'm a vascular surgeon. I work in San Francisco. And uh, I've been in practice for uh, 15 years now. And for the first seven years, I worked uh, exclusively in the hospital. And I found that this was a very frustrating experience for the patients because most of my patients, 90% of the time, they just need an outpatient procedure, uh, either the leg or dialysis access. And then afterwards, they can, after a short period of recovery, safely return home. And I would do these procedures, but for the patient, the patient would just get completely lost in the system. They would be, you know, have to go from the lobby to the fourth floor to a different place on the fourth floor to a, and then the nurses didn't know what procedures they were getting. And then there would be a delay because there was a patient with a stroke. And then when I opened an outpatient center about eight years ago, we have the exact same services, but now they're done by a team that's dedicated to the care of that patient and that particular problem. So it's with us, it's a family. Our patients are part of our family. They come in, we get to know them. We have the same nurses and the patients have the same issues. It, they have the same procedure, but it's done more quickly and it's done more effectively. And the recovery is monitored by people that are familiar with their pathology, familiar with their problems. And it's actually paradoxically safer, even though the hospital isn't there, because we have a whole team that's dedicated just to the care of that patient. And so for the last eight years in our outpatient center, we've been able to take care of all of these patients and for the patients, it's been an amazing experience, and for the doctors as well. I'm Dr. Paul Gagne. I'm a vascular surgeon in uh, Connecticut, and I've worked in the OBL space now for over 10 years, and uh, very much similar to Daniel. Uh, if you realize or, or reflect for a second that there is a pandemic of vascular disease in this country as our population ages, as we see an increase in diabetes, there's an increasing amount of peripheral artery disease. 
And so what we're seeing uh, is, uh, especially post pandemic where Oh no, I think that that Paul froze. We might have to give him a moment to come back and 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 join us. I mean, I, I can actually pick up a little bit. I think that the point that Paul was trying to make is that because the hospitals were somewhat inaccessible during the COVID, we were able to step in and really provide a, a, that service on an outpatient basis to these patients who were in a situation where they really couldn't get care elsewhere. So um, it was. Um, uh, emphasizes the importance of our role to the care of the vascular uh, patients in all of our communities. I think uh, Daniel's right. And, and I think that uh, the hospitals are still recovering from this. They're still trying to get uh, fully staffed up uh, and it's a chronic challenge. And we have staff who are dedicated to one disease state and one disease state only, which is vascular disease and interventions to treat it and fix it. And uh, we do it uh, efficiently uh, and, you know, it's a type like anything else in life, the more you do it, the better you are. And if you're doing it day by day, uh, you just get very good at it. Uh, and that's to the benefit of patients. Uh, you're not trying to educate the staff how to do these cases uh, in the process of taking care of the patient. Yeah. I'm curious from the patient's perspective, um, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to jump on. I think Marsha wants to speak up. Well, I just had an experience I was going to share um, when I had intervention for PAD at a hospital with a with a wonderful, wonderful interventional cardiologist. But in recovery, you know, the band they put on your artery to clamp it. Um, it was on my foot because is that retrograde access, I guess. Yes. Approach. So uh, but it was on my foot and my foot literally turned like deep, dark purple. It was on so tight by a nurse. This was in July, the end of July of last year, so 2023. And she wouldn't listen to me. I said, it hurts. My whole leg was cramping up. It was, it was so painful. I finally took a picture and sent it to Kim and she messaged my doctor who was in there lickety split and got the thing off. But evidently the nurse wasn't a routine, wasn't routinely doing that part of a procedure and, and was not knowledgeable. It could have, I don't know what could have happened, but um, it was on there for too long. And it Marcia, hurt. that's a, a great point that you're making. And it's I, I, my nurse, I, my desk where I sit is literally 15 feet from where my nurse, and by the way, all, all my nurse does is take care of vascular patients. She can just mm -hmm. walk right down the hall and get me. And she's also taking care of 2,000 patients with this exact same problem. So it's a, it's a really good point. I appreciate you uh, for bringing that up because- uh, Well, doctor, my doctor was not far away. It was that she thought she had done it right and that that was normal. Right. And you that know. was a major- it's you. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I certainly can tell or a nurse and but I can certainly tell when something is is seriously wrong. And I appreciate a, a doctor that you know, when I have them on speed dial that he or she answers my plea for help. Um, this was actually via Twitter. I hadn't gotten on speed dial at that point, And he saw my, my note pop up in his notifications. And he's like, oh, thank you. They didn't even notify him. And I think that that's also the value of being in one of these independent facilities is there isn't some sort of um, revolving door of, of staff that, and there's also a huge staffing shortage at a lot of these hospitals right now. So bless their hearts. All of these people are just, you know, working, working, working and working and being shuffled around to all these different areas of these hospital centers versus in an office-based lab, you do have this continuous or continuity of care. I was in, I've been in quite a few um, office, uh, not office-based labs, but um, labs within hospitals. And there was one in particular, and I've experienced this mostly at the university hospitals, not as much as at a regular community hospital, but, you know, it hits five o'clock and there's a nursing change and there's a tech change. And in the middle of a procedure, and this has happened multiple times, where they stop down the procedure where they're at as long as it's safe. And then they have to do a whole um, shift change. 
with other nurses, other techs, and they all have to brief each other and all that jazz. And well, of course the doctor has to remain, right? But the entire staff changes. And I personally would prefer if I was having a procedure done, I would want the same staff from start to finish just for, you know, continuity of care. I think um, uh, to your point, the staff that replaces the day staff may not be as experienced with these type of procedures uh, as, as you'd like. And so you're basically, you know, you're, you're have a team behind you and surgery and procedures is all about teamwork. I'll jump right in because we're, <laughs> we're of the same mind. You know, I, when you, when you do something over and over and over and over again, and you have a team that really cares and they're the same team that's been with you for eight years, you're going to catch a lot of problems that you wouldn't otherwise catch. Uh, so much better for the patients. Can you talk about these cuts that I mentioned in the beginning? I know we talked in the first hour about them, but we have a few people that are joining us. And we also have Larry Shorty Coleman, who's going to be piping in here in a few minutes with his experiences and his insight and asking some questions, as well as Douglas and possibly Hines. I think Sid is there as well. Um, the Right now, these office-based labs that we're talking about, they're in jeopardy. We're seeing, you know, quite a few of them go out of business. Um, they're not able to compete, not able to stay afloat with 8% cuts, right, in the reimbursement um, of these, these doctors, while doctors in hospitals, you know, are maintaining and even getting pay increases, correct? Um, and on top of that, the other issue, just to make matters worse, is then you have 8% inflation. And so, Either they have to go out of business or they have to consolidate where they come together. I, I know in cardiology, this is happening a lot. And we're also seeing a lot of private equity firms come in and buy up a bunch of these vascular centers so that you can create this, this mass negotiation for medical supplies to bring down some of those tips, right? But a lot of you would rather stay independent and feel it's better to be independent so you can still make your own choices and continue to give the best care that you can without having anyone, you know, get in the way and be financially driven, right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, that the 8% cuts this year combined with 8% inflation is a, a double whammy, but it's 8% cuts this year on top of similar cuts in the year prior and the year prior to that, such that when we made our business plan in 2015, the numbers were 30 to 40% higher than they are now. So our margin becomes very thin and uh, this wonderful model is at risk of evaporating to the huge detriment to our uh, community. And unfortunately, uh, we're looking at another set of cuts uh, that are planned for 2024. And oh, so, no. So it's uh, not it was, is this just a string of cuts that they do? Or is there another reason for those cuts? When the cuts were started a couple of years ago, it was planned to phase in over multiple years. And so there's programmed cuts coming down the road for us. Wow, Daniel, what are those cuts that we're talking about down the road additionally? So we only already had these 8% cuts, or is this the 8% cut that's just going to be total? Right. So they, there's an initial, I mean, it's a little bit, again, of a black box, and uh, we don't quite know what to actually uh, expect each year because sometimes the cuts go through and sometimes they're averted. But as things stand now, we're due for another coming up another significant cut uh, and that might be the end of uh, the OBL in San Francisco if that doesn't get averted. Wow. I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I imagine that it's the same way across the country, but here where I live, um, we have two major health networks and I don't know, it, it's probably is the way it is. And my doctor is in another town um, with the major hospital network. Are you guys like independent of networks? And I'm wondering if that's why, because that's the big business. It's like a conglomerate with the hospital networks. 
you know, we're dinosaurs. We are in, well, I am, I, I think Paul as well. I, I'm in private practice, which essentially means that I, I own my own business. And, um, you know, as long as the reimbursement from Medicare is adequate, I can stay in business. And that business is the care of patients with vascular problems. And it is the far and away best model for taking care of these patients. And it's really been put at risk. Yeah. And, and I would say that the places where there is these large hospital complexes and networks, uh, what you actually see when they do the health economics analysis is in general, cost of care in those places, in those areas start to go up. The premiums for insurance plans start to go up. So to uh, Daniel's point, if you're looking for a lower cost, high value way to provide care, uh, this OBL platform is, is a great idea. And it actually cuts costs to CMS. And unfortunately, because of some unintended consequences to the laws uh, around CMS budgeting, uh, we're getting cut. And that's what this the bill that Congressman Bill Arrakis and his colleagues uh, are promoting is to try to reverse some of those cuts to go get by the, the unintended consequences of previous legislation. I'm curious is from, that, uh, go ahead, Mar go ahead, Marsha. I was just gonna ask you, is that across the board, like with a family physician, just like a general family physician, um, are they trying to get rid of those as well so that they can like grab them up through networks? Well, CMS is, has actually taken many steps appropriately to help private practice uh, primary care physicians. But again, because of the budget neutrality required for office-based care, uh, we as office-based lab uh, owners uh, have actually been cut so that they can increase the reimbursement to primary care doctors. We applaud their efforts to improve primary care, uh, but they're picking winners and losers because of the laws around budget neutrality. And we'd like us all to be winners to be able to stay in practice and care for patients. It's really that whole idea of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And while it worked in years past and in other situations, that what we're dealing with right now is a real epidemic that's never been seen before because of diabetes. And with peripheral artery, with diabetes just out of control right now around the world and peripheral artery disease, a, a serious complication because of it, um, that's becoming more prevalent more and more people are getting diagnosed now that everyone's starting to become more aware of this. They're not just brushing it off as well. They still are, but not as much as diabetic neuropathy, the, the pain, the cramping, the, you know, things like that. Um, even that, even the numbness can be caused by the lack of blood flow. And a lot of it is that we have more patients that are in need of being treated sooner rather than later. I know these hospitals are bursting at the seams with peripheral artery disease patients. They can't, I mean, the fact that there is this patient in Dayton, Ohio, that has a wound, has rest pain, can barely walk from the bed to the bathroom and can't even get in to see the vascular surgeon. The nurse practitioner calls her last night and says, hey, yes, you need some serious care. We're going to do about three different bypasses on you, but the doctor can't get you in for three more weeks versus I was able to get on the phone with an office-based lab physician. And he said, we can squeeze that person in, get the consult done on Tuesday, and I will fit them into the lab next Thursday to get them revascularized in and out. Do they have less demand in the in these office-based labs? No, it's just there's less red tape and the doctors aren't pulled in as many different directions. In hospitals, you also have um, to go and check on patients, right, that have been admitted. You have your on-call duties over in the emergency room and on and on and on and on. And so when you have an office-based lab, you're 100% focused. Um, and sometimes some of the office-based lab doctors, they don't have any constraints in terms of time. So you're able to spend so much more time on patients. And I've had even doctors call me at 10 o'clock at night saying, hey, I just finished the case. I'm going to stay here till one o'clock in the morning with this patient. I might even get a hotel nearby, blah, blah, blah. You know, really putting patients first when it comes to the care 
that they need. So um, I, I find a lot of these passionate doctors such as yourselves, you guys don't stop working, do you? You're you're never off. Uh, you know, it's kind of what we do. I mean, vascular surgery is not a, a nine to five job. <laughs> it really isn't. No, it's very true. Um, Larry, do you want to jump in and, and share just some of your perspectives of what you're hearing so far and your experience um, being treated in both a hospital and an office-based lab? You might want to unmute. Well, he's figuring out that. Why don't we jump over to, to Douglas and have Douglas share? Because your first experience in being treated for peripheral artery disease as well was in a, a hospital. And your first couple of years, what of care was in a hospital. And then you transitioned to an office-based lab. Do you want to talk about your experiences? Well, I, I, for the two doctors that we have available, the question comes down to, as a patient, part of my story is, yes, between a, a hospital and getting in touch with an outpatient. But as a patient, how do we choose? How do we know we are in the right place at that time between knowing that we're with a good doctor or that doctor that we're with now, whether it, it, if it's in an outpatient or a hospital setting, do we know they have the ability to do what is needed to be done for us? Because I, I was in the hospital, I had, he, I talked to my neighbor this morning and he had the same vascular surgeon I did. He had the same axial bifemoral bypass done and it almost cost him his life by the same doctor who is now, who, who was the same one who did my surgery also. And it, to, do, to this day, it's 100% occluded and causing all kinds of problems. And then now, you know, it, I think it's created a heart condition that I have now. I had open heart surgery in September, and I can't see the heart doctor till August. And I'm having issues every day. I fell this morning, but that's another story. But, I mean, so it's that, how do, as a patient, how do I know? I'm in the right place between I, being. I really appreciate that question. You know, that's really hard from a, a, a patient's perspective. How do you know that you're with the right doctor? You know, I think that this is uh, one of the great things about what Kim is doing is that she provides that connection between the patient and the doctor. Um, you know, I try to uh, make sure that every doctor in my area knows about me and that I'm available. Uh, and I'd like to think that, you know, your, your, your reputation in the community is what kind of uh, gets around so that all the doctors know that if work like that needs to be done, I'm available to do it. Um, uh, but it's hard it, from a patient's perspective. How, how can you tell? How do you know? How do you get to the right doctor? And What's to prevent that doctor from saying, making claims that, that aren't correct about their abilities or about what they can do for you? Right? It's right. a really good question without an easy answer. Because the doctor who put, I'm in, I'm in Texas, and, and the doctor who put the Axio in me, everyone in the whole community thinks he's one of the best doctors in the community. Well, he's renowned in the community, and I've had several paces. So uh, Douglas ended up with an axillary bifemoral bypass, which if you look in the UK, it's considered palliative care there to get. I, I've never, I don't know about Paul. I've never been years. I've done one of those. Right. Um, okay. And, but we literally, we see so many coming out of this doctor over in this one particular area. We've had two patients go septic. One graft had to be removed. You had Douglas that ended up his blocked within six months. And it's bad news. And this doctor is still practicing you know, in this hospital. And this hospital doesn't know any different um, that these patients, they just either go home and die or they end up, you know, going somewhere else uh, for, for better care. Like Douglas was able to find us, but he went from with this same doctor because he thinks, and like everyone does, that 
every doctor has their best interest at heart. And I think that the doctors do, but sometimes they just don't know what they don't know. And they just do what they know how to do. They're referred a patient. And so they feel responsible for this patient to do what's in their armamentarium to do. They don't think outside that they should send this patient here or there for a different care. A lot of them don't even know that Uh, there's other care options elsewhere or other tools or other techniques because they're so overburdened and, you know, working with 20 to 30 patients per day in a hospital system. And so for Douglas, he ended up going in with it for a couple stents. Those stents got blocked within six months. He ended up with an aorto bifemoral bypass that got blocked up within six months. And then they went in and said they couldn't open that, ended up with an axillo bifemoral bypass And that blocked up within six months. And that's when he found us. We were Mm -hmm. able to get him to actually a couple of different office-based lab facilities. And one doctor first who had privileges, he had the OBL, but also privileges at a hospital, was able to perform the first one in a hospital, the second one in an office-based lab. And that doctor was able to bypass the bypasses which was incredible. And he's been open ever since. Now the problem he's having, which he was talking about, which no doctor seems to be able to understand our logic, which is you have this blocked axillo bifemoral bypass and suddenly you have this steel syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. What do you call it? The subclavian steel syndrome where it's like this backwash and it's causing structural problems on his heart. But because most patients who have this, this procedure die, you know, what, within months, if not years, um, maybe they don't get to that point for it to be something that people know about. So Douglas is here with structural problems in his heart that seem to come out of nowhere. And only one doctor, his heart doctor said, hmm, I think that it's because of that, but still no one's doing anything about it. And he goes into the hospital with some serious symptoms and they're not doing anything. He spent two days inside the hospital before they even did a, ca- a CT scan on him. He was just sitting there in the hospital with severe symptoms, passing out. He's, he tells you he falls. He, his blood pressure was not normal. His Douglas, what was the other stuff? The BNP? The, 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 How, thing, of, your the, BNP? the thing about it is this. I, I just spent, what, five days, two weeks ago five in days. the hospital and saw seven different doctors with seven different opinions. And that I think that's part of that insanity, but what I've learned through this group and what we are trying to help our client, our patients with is that learning ability. Because what I know now about when I saw Dr. Z, oops, when I saw the doctor in Houston compared to who I had here in Beaumont, just the sound of him in that outpatient setting was different than the doctor was in the hospital. So, and- How so? How so, Douglas? Because I I think it was what Larry, from the moment I walked into his office, it was 100% different than when I was in the hospital. 100% by the, from the first lady I met who took my name to when I saw him. And all the questions that I brought with me that he was able to answer compared to what the, when I was in the other one, he just called my brother and said, we're either going to do this or you're going to lose your leg, remember? And that was very simple. So it was kind of like, what is my brother supposed to say, <laughs> you know? So it is that it's, 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 the, it's just that big a difference as a patient is what I deal with today. I called this morning to tell them what was going on and say, well, sorry, we, we just have no openings. If you, if you feel like you need to go to ER, go to the ER. But then what happens is I spent what five days a week, two weeks ago and saw seven different doctors while I was in the hospital. I, I think what you're talking about Douglas is, you know, in the outpatient setting, the system that it's being threatened, we, we take a real ownership of our patients. Uh, When our patient comes into our office, uh, everybody uh, from the receptionist to the nurse, to the tech, to the medical assistants are all geared towards one thing, which is taking care of that patient. Whereas 
in the hospital and some other settings, hey, people have different agendas. Uh, people may not know the full picture. They might not have all of your best interests at heart, but I can guarantee you that in my office, everybody's geared around the care of every patient that comes into that office. And it, it is, it, they become part of our family. I'd like to chime in. Go yes, ahead. Sir. Yeah, um, I might be the exception and not the rule based on this conversation. I went first to a hospital with leg pad and uh, had a couple atherectomies. And of course the plaque came back and the doctor at the hospital said, well, um, I think if it gets worse, we might have to do a fempop bypass. And that's when I contacted Kim. And based on what Dr. Nathanson said, yeah, Kim is your resource. And I contacted her. And I went from a hospital to a OBL in Denver. And uh, you're right. The one-on-one -on -one experience is a lot different. But I have no complaints about the hospital. I really don't. They treated me first class. Yeah, I, I just think, think they reached their limits. And, you know, they didn't know how to handle a recurring problem. Or they weren't. You know, like I said, they wanted to push me off for a FEMPOP bypass. And the new doctors in the OBL said, no, let's try this and let's try that. And I, the doctors I was uh, recommended to were from Kim. And they were a big lifesaver for me because I'm fine now. I can't say I'll always be fine, but I'm fine now. But again, yeah, but I might be the exception, not the rule, because I have no complaints about the hospital. Well, except in, and they did treat you kind. They just they only could offer you the options that they could offer you. They didn't offer you or allow you a second opinion within the facility. Right. right. And, and hospitals play a very important role in a lot of what we do. We still do in hospitals. You know, as a vascular surgeon, we do aortic aneurysm repair and carotid interventions. And, you know, our, our relationship with the hospital is still one of, of importance and there's nothing, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I don't feel, and I don't think uh, we have a, a inherent, um, you know, without the hospital, we wouldn't be able to do a significant amount of what we do. It's just that for a lot of what we do, the office-based practice is much better suited. Yeah, I think, you know, the hospitals play an important role. There are certain types of procedures that need a hospital. But as uh, Daniel said, you know, not everything needs a hospital. And remember, these are general hospitals. So they're taking care of patients with cancer, taking patient care of patients with broken bones who need back surgery and hip surgery. And so um, it's not always possible to be an expert at everything. And, right. Yeah, and so, exactly. Not an expert at everything. Right. So, so there are other ways to uh, access care. And I think, you know, um, talking to your doctors about other options and looking for second opinions is always something that's, that's important. But at some point, you end up having to place your confidence in somebody uh, and, and move forward. Uh, and, but, but it doesn't always have to be uh, where you started. And I think you made a good move to look around and see if there are other options. Right. I mean, I she kept, uh, the Tim kept saying that uh, go for a second opinion or a third opinion. That's uh, struck home with me. And with that, uh, when I had my last atherectomy, um, angioplasty, I actually had two doctors doing it, <laughs> not one, two doctors in an OBL situation. I was elated. I mean, seriously, I, I couldn't ask for anything better. Well, and I will tell you that there's a technology just got approved by FDA this week that is a FEMPOP bypass that can be done through small punctures in the skin uh, in an OBL setting uh, mm -hmm. over a couple of hours uh, and rather than making incisions and having to do a bypass. So as technology evolves, the setting, these outpatient settings for doing uh, interventions for PAD uh, is only expanding. Yes, so, it was called PTIPAP, and it's now yes. called PTAB, and it's owned by Endologics. I just saw, I'm curious how they're going to handle the rollout. And so one of the other questions, how do we as patients help, help y'all get 
stay where y'all are and not lose what we have with y'all? How is there a way that we can help y'all do this? I think you need to contact your congressman to tell them that you've had a life-saving or limb-saving experience uh, in these settings uh, and that they've been important to your health and well-being where you were about to lose your life or your leg and ask them to support us by supporting reimbursement because we've been, we're, our reimbursement is down uh, 20 to 25% over the last, you know, just the last four or five years. Uh, and it keeps going down when you, especially when you take into account inflation. So again, it's uh, House Resolution uh, 3674 is the bill that's in front of us right now to try to change reimbursement for this year. But again, uh, we need that help going forward uh, over the years to come and letting your congressman know that these were important places for you to get health care would be helpful to us. Nancy, did you want to share your experience? Oh, sure. I'd love to. Please um, go ahead. I selected the, the teaching um, doctor at, at a, uh, a big system in my area a metropolitan, a big metropolitan area um, to go and have my first consult with after I got my ABI test results. And right off the bat, you need a femoral bypass, a surgery. I'm gonna make two incisions, which he did do. And um, he had me... <laughs> stuck in the bed for three days before I could get out of the bed and move. And as soon as I got out, I said, I'm going home, check me out of here. I went home and I waited three months to go and have my leg tested to see if there was any blood circulating and there wasn't nothing. So he wanted me to come in and I don't know what he actually planned to do because he didn't talk to me. He wouldn't talk to me. He didn't make any effort to contact me. Um, somebody else was trying to railroad me into getting that scheduled and getting that done on a Monday. And this was a Friday I had the test done. They were calling me in the car the minute I left the clinic from having the test done. They were so anxious to get me in there for another surgery. And I felt so uncomfortable with it. And that's when I reached out to Kim and I found the interventional radiologist um, as opposed to the vascular surgeon who didn't even bother to address the block that was causing uh, my leg to not have any circulation below the knee. He just simply did the surgery and let me sit there for three months, not able to walk and in pain with a leg that was never going to recover because he didn't address that but he wanted to start all over again. So I was just thrilled to death that Kim was able to find someone in my area and I was able to get it done. Um, I think I saw him, I, I dropped some discs off from my results on a Saturday at his home. He called me on Sunday. I was in his office on Tuesday for the first meeting and Thursday he did the procedure. So, and this was at an office-based lab. Yes. Yeah. What was yeah. the difference in terms of experience for you um, being in an office-based lab versus a hospital in expediting your procedure and providing a variety of options for you? Well, I was confined, like I said, to the bed because they had me catheterized on account of the fact that they gave me a spinal as well as sedation for the procedure because he said it was going to last three and a half to four hours but it only lasted a little over an hour and that was really annoying but um I, I guess they what they did was they're testing for some company a new device which is called a drain so they had that taped between my crotch and my abdomen um the whole duration that I was in the hospital and for a week afterwards. And when they took it off, there was absolutely nothing in there. 
And I was wearing it 24 seven. I couldn't even take it off. It was taped to me. You know, I didn't have to do that when I walked out of the interventional radiologist. All he did was make one little tiny incision that he didn't even have to stitch close. He did tell me he put uh, a stainless steel plug in there that he can take out if he has to go back. So it was easy peasy and I walked right out. And the pain was gone. You know what, what so I think tends to happen is that as vascular surgeons of a older generation, you know, if you have a tool in your toolbox, that's the only tool that you have, you're going to use that tool. And it's, um, I think it's fortunately less common as we move forward to have a vascular surgeon who isn't also trained in the minimally invasive techniques. But yeah, you know, there's actually been a, a new study that came out that suggests uh, definitively that um, patients live longer and do better if you do the minimally invasive procedure as the primary procedure, which uh, in your case, Nancy, it's clear that if you had had that from the get-go, you never would have needed that stay in the hospital no. and that operation. And, and it's a uh, are just a question of getting the word out um, in our community. Right. So, they, you know, I, we, we right. applaud Kim's efforts in that regard. And yeah, and the, go ahead. Um, the, the problem is, is now I'm living with this inflated thigh that's holding on to that bypass, doing absolutely nothing except I'm having to carry it around. And I'm still lifting that leg into the car every time I get in there. Nancy, what, can I ask you, did, did they use um, a, uh, pro, a um, plastic tube to do the bypass or Gore-Tex tube or, or, or did they use your own vein? What they told me was, you don't, he told me this, you don't have any veins that are viable to use for this transplant. So we're going to put a cadaver vein in there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually interesting in, in the last six months or so, uh, there's a large study that's been in, in place for many years in the U.S. Uh, looking at the role of minimally invasive techniques. Uh, and, and another study just came out recently out of Europe, uh, and they came to similar conclusions, which is the majority of patients who are older with other medical problems may not have a good vein, as you pointed out, Nancy, do better with minimally invasive techniques uh, that as a first line th therapy. And so that's thinking about that as evolving, uh, and, uh, I think, uh, empowering because it's, there's less question about what to do first and the new technologies just keep evolving and, and, uh, and the options for treatment. And so, uh, patients will benefit from that minimally invasive approach. And, and the way we look at it, uh, the way to my heart is to us, title means nothing. The skill set means everything. And what is the skill set that is particularly right for that patient? And if they are an interventional radiologist and an interventional cardiologist, do they have a partner who's a vascular surgeon where they can do hybrid approaches and are willing to give up the patient and collaborate for the benefit of a patient if necessary? Um, you know, when it comes to vascular surgeons, we're seeing, as you said, more and more that literally can do everything themselves from endovascular trained in advanced limb salvage and can make that determination, which is the subject of this new latest best CLI study, which is a study on endovascular approaches versus vascular um, sur surgical approaches for advanced stages of PAD, which is critical limb ischemia. Do you bypass or do you use the wires and balloons? And um, you know, it, it's it's really those those vascular surgeons that have both of those options as well, right there in their fingertips, and can make those determinations themselves. And we're seeing more and more who are able to do so. But for us, patient outcomes are everything. Uh, Lawrence yeah. Coleman, Larry yes, Shorty. Uh, Coleman. Yes, I have a question. I'm having problems uh, getting on Zoom and what have no you. Worries. But first of all, good evening to each and every one of you. You all have some great stories. Mine revolves in having PAD, which I was told it stays with you for the rest of your life. But however, 
what a patient is going to do if this bill passes and we're cut off from getting assistance, not being able to pay. You're going to be um, needing to draw on the services of your local hospitals uh, because that'll be the only other location uh, that will have these resources. Uh, you do need a x-ray suite to work in. You do need very special tools to work with, which we have in our OBLs. Um, and, and that's how we can get best practices and best care. Um, if we don't, if we're not open, the only other location that has that type of capability is going to be your local hospital. And uh, some hospitals will do a good job for you, but others are trying to keep up with all the demands that they're under. So it's harder. Yes. And the next question is, do you feel that a person with PAD immune system gets affected by that disease? Um. You know, there, there can be a lot going on with um, our patients who generally have uh, uh, many comorbidities and um, the uh, underlying um, peripheral arterial disease can have an inflammatory component and there may be uh, an immune component to that. But I will say that that's not one of the things that we usually look for primarily in our patients that have peripheral arterial disease. <laughs> But I would say that patients who have peripheral artery disease, the cause of that peripheral artery disease may be something like diabetes that can affect the immune system. So you may actually have an immune issue and PAD due to some other underlying problem. Yes, and thank you very much for that answer. And uh, Doug, a question for you. How are you doing? Well, I want to go, Dan. What is the difference between like the Gore-Tex valve replacement or the Gore-Tex thing and like having a regular valve or one of your regular veins? Well, the Gore-Tex tube, which um, you will use if we don't have a vein available, uh, is prone to infection um, and blockage at a much higher rate than if we have your own vein to use. So. Uh, most uh, vascular surgeons and all vascular surgeons should, uh, we believe, use the, your own vein if it's available. The problem is that many are just too small or, or uh, varicose or have been harvested for a bypass. So we don't always have that option. So I'm curious, Larry, if you, um, when you were dealing with, with your care in a hospital versus office-based lab, Talk about the timeliness of your care, how quickly you were able to get in for your appointments. Were you able to get in to see your doctors in the hospital versus the OBL? Can you talk about those experiences just from the timely, effective care perspective? Well, for me, it was just basically having really bad pain and I went to emergency and wasn't the greatest idea of going to emergency, but when you're in pain, you want to go somewhere. However, when I went, this individual came in as a doctor. I won't use names, but first thing he said to me and my family at that time before COVID hit, that I needed to have that leg amputated right away. I was totally against that. So I decided to leave. And once he left the office, I mean, in the room, I checked out and I said, whoever want to stay, stay. Then in, uh, I'll say less than a week, I was right back in to mm -hmm. emergency and I asked to see more than one doctor, which I thought was smart on my part. However, I had to see eight doctors to make a decision. However, COVID did happen and I stayed 10 days they always decide what's best to do, do this surgery. I had eight surgeries to save this leg. And being a former athlete, boy, you talking about a hard decision. Very difficult for me. So those of you out there that don't think it's uh, crazy to make decisions, these kind of decisions save your life, though. I realize that now. But going to a regular doctor wasn't going to work for me. They put you off until you go to this person or that person. I hope that answers your question. And basically, I just pray that no one else had to go through what I went through. Right. But prior to the amputation, 
your experience was you weren't able to get into um, your doctor for timely effective care for that leg to um, make sure it didn't advance to the extent that it did where it was limb threatening. No, I never got a chance to go to my regular doctor. I went to emergency, like I said, because of the pain. Yeah, the and pain got so great, you couldn't get an appointment soonest to get into yeah. a regular, your, your regular supervising physician. And so you ended up having to go to emergency and in emergency, they're just, just going to try and get rid of that pain. And they said amputation. Well, he said that I had several blockage and which I wasn't aware of what blockage was. Former athlete, I know from my mom, she had, uh, she didn't have blockage. She had blood clots because of diabetes. And I stopped putting one and one together. I said, I don't know what I've done wrong to cause this. But nevertheless, Kim, it's difficult trying to go to a regular doctor. They oh, we don't have any openings at the time. You're the one in pain. You have to make a drastic decision. Yeah. And so how has the experience been different in working with an office-based lab such as you are right now over in Atlanta versus the previous facility? Oh, it's 100% different. And I thank you once again for referring, Dr. Red. I don't mind using doctors' names when they do great things. And I, I think all of them try their best to do a great job. But this is the one that I experienced that's doing good for me. Being that I have several blockages in my other leg, he opening up two of them. One is 90% blocked. And I'm just hoping and praying once I start to walk again with the prosthetic that everything will be fine once I take some of the pressure off. It. That's what I'm hoping. How is it in terms of, describe the experience at the front office and making appointment. Are you able well, to? feel like you're able to get in sooner rather than later oh man it's all it takes is one phone call well okay we have something scheduled such and such date which is good for you yeah i had a variety of dates to choose from and i chose the best one for me along with you know providing the ride through your service and it was a piece of cake for me they're very upfront and professional have you had to go to the emergency room since working with the OBL for your EAD since? No, it, the pain went away, I'd say 80%. It's nothing compared to what it was. And my foot doesn't swell up, my leg don't swell up. And I just hope and pray everything's going well. And I'm scheduled to go back in three months, which is probably a month and a half from now. What is your relationship like with this vascular specialist versus the one that you were experiencing in the, in the hospital? What's the feeling? What's that relationship? The relationship is he's open, open with me and he's very honest and he's candid about what he tells you. He'd be, he's so truthful that it, it scares you like, Oh, maybe he's just telling me it. No, but not only that, he goes into detail and explain to you before you have a procedure, he said, I don't believe in stents. He said, that doesn't help. And who am I? I have to take his word, which he was living proof. I had two stents put in before I went to him. A month later, I was still in the same pain. So I, I trust in him and I'm going to continue to go to him. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Doctors, do you have any questions for him on his experience that you think um, could be valuable or, or shed light on, you know, the, the reality of, of the OBL value? Yeah, well, you know, it's a great illustration. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, well, you know, when you have uh, a, a doctor who works in an environment that is supportive of what they do, it, you're able to really focus on taking care of patients. And I, it sounds to me that your doctor in Atlanta takes care of his patients the way I take care of my patients. And yeah. it's the office-based lab, this model that allows us to do this. 
Uh, without it, we can't. We go back to the hospital and everybody's a stranger again, and it's the patients that lose. So we really need to figure out how to support that bill and, and push that through. It's uh, absolutely key. Well, maybe some of us with PAD need to go to Washington and protest as long as we can stand, sure. not walk around it too much, but walk enough. Let them know we're taking one step closer to telling them mm -hmm. we need this bill to pass. Mm 